mysterywire.com home of the unusual and unknown from area 51 to the paranormal it's your source to the most vetted ufo stories and special investigations in the world take a journey into the universe of mysterywire.com this uh, craft it's doing these incredible maneuvers it's uh it enters and exits the water it splits into two um it goes dark uh, and uh, this, this suggests it's not a balloon, it's not birds, it's not any aircraft. That leaves you kind of in a category of unknown, right? It, it does. And, and we, I mean, George, we even went to the point of like looking to find out whether there, you know, that there are any drones that can, are capable of doing this. Uh, you know, and we did do some research and the Navy had been experimenting on things like, whether there was one that we found that was called the Flimmer. Uh, and bottom line on it was it's more like a drone that has wings to it and it's got the fuselage, the long fuselage to it. And then what happens is it goes into the water, the wings come apart and it, it's, it acts more like a torpedo. But it doesn't come out on the other end and then pop up in the air, right? And it doesn't split into two. So again, you know, you go through this like try it logic trail to be able to make sense of this. We calculated the speed varied in everywhere from like roughly around 80 to 85 miles an hour and higher. Uh, when it hit the water, it was about 109 miles per hour. Uh, it, even when it was underneath the water, it was traversing across at about, about an 80 mile an hour clip. And it, it varied, and then eventually it kind of slows down a little bit. It was down, I think it got down to about 40 miles per hour. Uh, and then uh, you see it just barely moving when it comes out of the water. So, and, you know, we literally were measuring speeds and then we'd have to be able to deduct uh, the aircraft speed from that, you know, and be able to figure that out. There were certain parts when the, uh, the video, we could actually make matches and, and, and we could actually see that the object went behind a telephone pole, which allowed us to then deduce this, you know, the size of the pole and compare that to the object. And we actually got a distance on there and we were able to then deduce that it was about, roughly about three to five feet in diameter. It was all the bigger that it was. So if you hit the water going 109 miles an hour, we don't have a lot of craft that can do that and not break apart, I would think. Yeah, well, precisely. And, and see, and that's the same kind of thing when, when you put this in the scenario of even the Nimitz case, right? Take a look at that, you know? The object was seen to be not being impacted by the air at all. I mean, these things have always never been impacted by air. You don't hear sonic booms when they take off. They, they, they ha can have these unusual shapes to them, like squares and cubes, and apparently go at, at these incredible speeds. So apparently, our atmosphere, I mean, these things are not structured, or they somehow manipulate space around them in some such way, that, including water to be able to go underneath the water and to do what they do and hardly leave a track. And, and so, you know, the objects that you would experience uh, and, and report it back in the 50s are very much like the Tic Tacs today. They're not doing anything different. Those five observables that Lou talks about, I mean, those things have been around through history. And, and in fact, he was on a show last night with, uh, you know, uh, discussing this with, uh, it was that uh, Fade to Black, uh, radio guy yeah. yeah a radio guy anyway he was talking about uh lou was talking about last night and 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 he was like mentioning well if you even if you go back into like wonders in the sky the book by uh jacques Ballet. Ballet. yeah okay well that's covering these things are doing the same thing back then in in the recording that they are here now and so anyway okay should we be surprised that it can move under the water like it did and yeah no we shouldn't be uh, they've been doing it all along and and do they so there you go <laughs> again the lesson i think from the that aguadilla case as with tic tac is there there is evidence that can be studied by scientists if they are inclined to go ahead and take a look at it correct and and we should be doing that anyway i mean because regardless of whether there's some sort of an explanation down the road for this that's natural and prosaic and somebody can come up with a magical explanation for it uh we, we accept that we just would like to see them, you know, do the due diligence and not focus on, you know, many of the people that we've have written papers have been attacking us on the parallax issue, which we've already announced it, and they're they're claiming it's a balloon. 
And, and we say, well, wait a minute, have you looked at it in thermal? Have you, how, how do you explain the splitting of the balloons? And they don't look at the whole picture. They'll focus on one issue. And we say that that's not doing your science justice, okay? You have to look at all the facts. You can't pick and choose what you want to go into and do. Um, among the papers uh, that are posted on the SCU website, the Aguadilla analysis, the mm -hmm. Tic Tac analysis, Stephenville, great research in all of those, ver very much into the weeds, into the tiny oh, details, yeah. showing that you, you can study this if you want to study it. Yes. You still have diehards who will say, well, this is some kind of secret project. It's an American technology that's been developed and they just aren't telling us that they they engaged with the Nimitz and Princeton as sort of a test. Uh, and then the yeah. this pious uh, UFO patent put out by the Navy has <laughs> yeah. been greatly exploited to suggest, oh yeah, we've got this technology, we've got it figured out. Yeah. One of you can address the general idea that this is our technology, recognizing the fact that it doesn't explain UFOs from 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and whether or not that paper that we're discussing, this Pius paper, is really a good explanation for the kinds of um, details that you and your team have analyzed. So I, I don't know if you saw the recent news, but uh, apparently Pais was been, it's been pointed out the fact that that whole notion was just concept and it was not actually real. And, oh. <laughs> or, you know, and so uh, they've actually come out and, and got confirmation. In fact, the project was killed off because it didn't pan out. Okay. So, you know, so that's, because I was following that as well. I'm right. thinking like, wow, this is it. You know, this, this could be explained. But you're absolutely right. So what I've seen over my history with the whole UFOs, and I've seen the full spectrum going back 50, now going to be 57 years coming up in April. So, uh, you know, I've watched as the, our technology has definitely improved. I mean, our aircraft, are, we're, we're modernizing. We're using a whole lot of different things. Our propulsion systems are advancing. But if you take a look at it, George, we're still developing things for that certain medium that they're in. We're not developing for what objects do. And let me, let me clarify that. We build a great submarine to be able to go underwater. You can't take that submarine and now stick it in the air and expect that it's gonna have the propulsion system to fly, right? I can't take that thing and put it in space and expect that it's gonna operate either. And these objects, are the same object, a disc shaped object or whatever shape you wanna call it, that are flying into the water, performing at incredible speeds, fly, flying at those incredible speeds in the air, not breaking the sound barrier. And in space, if you wanna go with the fact that we've had observations of objects coming in from space. So those three medium, vacuum, air and water, they can traverse on the same kind of propulsion systems, which we you can't even see when you look at them. Nobody on earth has that technology. If you look at even what we're building with Elon Musk and everybody else, we're still putting rocket engines into place, okay? So what we're saying is we have to have one heck of a revolutionary change that's going on and maybe some other country's done it, but we, we know that in looking at our inventory that it doesn't match anything that we're developing. It's not flying like, maneuvering like, anything like we've got. Do you happen to know if the Russians and Chinese are in fact working on this um, from the perspective of a UAP, that it is unknown technology that they're trying to figure out versus something that they have built? Well, the Russians have always had a fascination with these objects. And if you take a look at it, uh, you know, I mean, they're encountering them under, under the water. A lot of their submarine reports that they've had, you know, We've had stories about that. They've experienced them in the air. There's gotta be an interest there. And there's also an interest in what we're doing with it. So you gotta understand that, you know, we're very visible and vocal about what we do oftentimes on the internet, which is not to our advantage, by the way. The Chinese have got an interest in it, that they, they're ready to look at anything that we've got. In fact, they're, they're busily stealing all of our secrets. So, uh, so you've got that kind of thing going on. And I don't think that anybody on the planet has got anything that indicates, like you don't see a, lar a large number of concentrated sightings over Russia of them flying their aircraft. 
You don't see uh, the Chinese, you don't hear about it anyway, uh, having a lot of UFO reports because they're taking off from their locations. You know, look at UFO sightings. They are global in nature. What organization or country is going to risk flying something of that high technical, technological uh, competence over in, in the middle of an exercise you're doing uh, or over a, another country and run the risk that it's going to be shot down, you know, knocked out of the sky or whatever, right? A look at the, the drop from 28,000 or 20,000 feet down to stop at sea level in 0.78 seconds. What can possibly withstand, well, what kind of metals do we have that could withstand that kind of like uh, fall? How, how, how would we have overcome mass and inertia, you know, on, on that and to done that? How do you stop when you're getting your accelerating downward and now you're decelerating? That's our technology and that's the way we think is we accelerate and then we decelerate to stop, right? In 0.78 seconds doing that, okay, I mean, you get where I'm going, right? There's nothing, you can't go to a Lockheed Martin and expect them to think that they're going to, they're still building the aircraft the same way. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's... You know, we still use combustion engines and, and ramjets and all that wonderful stuff. All of the, the, the things you get out there are mostly just on the drawing board, conceptual stuff. We talk about the fact that we've got objects and the Alcubierre drive, the idea that we're going to bend space and everything else. Those are just conceptual things. There's are nothing on a drawing board. We can't figure out. We haven't got anything that's mass producing enough to be able to create that kind of an effect. And you, you mentioned Paiste, you know, in his, he was using some sort of like a vibration, if you would, in a vacuum state and creating what they call a, a, a polarized vacuum uh, around the object. And, and, and he's using like little microwave transmitters, if you were, to be able to create that kind of like an effect. And while his idea didn't pan out, conceptually, that might help me to understand those cases that like you had in Delphos. Uh, and also when I investigated in, in Ohio back in the 70s, where a 70 foot in diameter circular area was baked two feet in the ground, there's a little bit of microwave radiation around it. And the weed has gone, you know, it, it's gone down to the roots. And uh, so what does that? There was a guy named Ted Phillips, the late Ted yep. Phillips, intrepid researcher. Yes. Spent decades pursuing a specialty of his that he called landing site trace cases. Yes. Where he objects, uh, witnesses see a craft in the sky on the ground. And then there are physical effects that are measurable, that are documentable. He had thousands of these that he pursued. Again, going back to the point that there is evidence that you can study physical evidence effects yeah. in connection with these craft that can be studied if you have the will to study them. And, and that's it. And we just need to be able to get the mindset that the, uh, the scientists we've been bringing on board with us, you know, for example, I think that the, the 2017 case did some sort of a shift in a lot of people's awareness of this thing, because now you're starting to see hallway conversations, even in the military world about this stuff that you didn't see before. You have scientists that are now willing to come on board, even in just our organization. And we're just like, we have about 109 people that, that are, uh, you know, we've got a great number of PhDs uh, from all different places. That, and we have all disciplines, you know, it's amazing the number of disciplines we've got in the organization. And these are all people that are willing to take the risk and to talk about it and have their names put on papers. And, and we're looking to be able to help build and put in place an actual peer review process, as well as a, a journal that we could publish in. And so we've, that's been needed because the regular mainstay come, you know, scientific world hasn't made the change, many of them. And the journals will still reject papers if you put it out on UFOs. And, and so that's not going to help us. But there is a shift, right? There is a shift since a 2017. Shift. I never thought I would see it in my <laughs> lifetime. You've been yeah. at this longer than I have. I yeah. can't imagine that you thought it would happen either. No, I mean, I... Well, you know, I, there's always the hope. I mean, even when Project Blue Book was going on, and I had a chance to even, you know, uh, I, I would do it. I was actually doing case investigations in Dayton with a Blue Book officer sitting next to me doing the same case. Huh. <laughs> and then we would talk. And then it led to me, 
in getting in contact with the actual people at the base, including Key, uh, 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 Quintanilla. Wow. And so now I'm connected to Quintanilla. And you know that they actually gave me a phone number that I could call up for a radar approach control number if I had cases I was working on? I mean, that's the kind of thing that I was talking about. So I was hopeful that something was always going to come around the corner. There's going to be this wonderful disclosure. It's going to happen, right? I've been doing this for decades now, right? It's going to be happening. Well, the Kyle report. Oh, well, that's going to be that's going to be great. You know, they're going to come out and say, well, they gay barely. Well, you know what that was like. And then that led into the closure of Blue Book. And, and I'm going like, well, OK, well, I guess that didn't pan out. Two other questions. Um, <laughs> the the uh, you know, the, the UFO topic has a lot of baggage for a variety of reasons. The personalities who are drawn to it, the wild claims that have been made that have driven a lot of scientists and technical people like yourself away from the subject. Uh, there's also people who are uncomfortable with the idea that it must be extraterrestrial. That's the paradigm, right? It's been the paradigm, at least when I started, that's what it probably is. You are careful to not make that leap. You don't say that as extraterrestrial. Do you have personal feelings on what that might be? What, what's the most likely answer to where these things are from? Yeah, I mean, George, I mean, there's so many different, like I, I give a presentation where I talk about the, these different hypotheses, if you would. Uh, there, there's, it's like one of them is called the ET hypothesis. And of course, we all know what that is, right? It's the extraterrestrial, like you talked about. And then Jacques Vallée came in with the IDH, which was the interdimensional kind of concept uh, that was going to be explaining because he was seeing that there were like, you know, relationships between cases and what testimony you would hear uh, compared to like, like leprechauns and fairy stories and all these other wonderful things that have happened over cult our cultural history and a world history. And, uh, and so it has a mythological kind of like component to it. Uh, then you have uh, the one that I've always been interested in, which was, there's, well, there's all, all, I have the ABH one that I created, which is the always been here. They've always been here. You know, they, they were probably here first. Okay. So conceptually that they've always been here and they could be uh, living underneath the water because we don't, they should call the planet Earth the planet water because three quarters of it is the water, you know? <laughs> and so, and we only know like, like 5% of what's down below that water, right? And we really don't know it very well. So could a, could a race have come here prior to this and always been uh, related to us here on this planet? And then guess what happens? Well, we start, you know, what do we do in the water? Well, we blow the hell out of it up with these atomic bombs that we put out in these atolls and everything else. And that's going to probably upset where they're living, right? <laughs> you know? And so maybe they need to pop up and see what the hell's going on and what the, the crazies that are up, up upstairs. And so that they begin doing that. And maybe that explains nuclear, uh, nuclear cases that we have. And those are like sending message to us. Hey, I've got to stop you from doing this kind of crap. And you need to pay attention to it. Or then there's the, the, the notion that you have, which is basically uh, that they're time travelers. And there's been a, you know, that long interest in, in the concept of the fact that they could be conceivably either us from the future or us from the past, if you would. And they're just using some manipulating time, which by the way, when you look at those conceptual kinds of things we hear about the Alcubierre drive and with the warp speed and, and, and being able to maybe warp space-time metric engineering, then we're conceivably playing around with a little bit of time travel or time capabilities there. And so is it feasible that maybe down the pike we figure that out and we're flying along or, or maybe ET does come down from there and says, here, yay barely, here's the technology. And that jumps us oh, very quickly over into building these kind of capabilities to where we're doing that. And then when you have Michael Masters, for example, who is now talking about the fact that it's something you don't often think about, but the beings are walking bipedal like we are. And oh, by the way, yeah, and their heads have changed and rotated to the point where they're looking straight ahead. They got two eyes, they got two arms, they got two legs. Then maybe we're talking about somebody in the future that's coming back because maybe and they're collecting DNA with abductees and maybe they need that because there's some things going on in the future that require that. 
So you know, you 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 can take this from these multiple angles and they and these hypotheses. And it could be a combination of all those. I mean, right. there could be literally a combination of that, and it's not like any one. But we don't have UFOs going out and with a little hubcap on the back and a little license plate that says where they're from. So we have to always speculate where they're from because we never see, guess what? When you see one in front of you and it shoots off, do you ever see it reported somewhere else? Mm-hmm. And did somebody else say that they saw it along like an airplane where we saw it on the flight path and it ended up and it stopped over here? No, we don't. And Heineck talked about it, that as being a space-time singularity. It exists in that moment, in that space, for that one period of time, and then it shoots off. And I kind of buy into what Heineck said on that. I, I really do, because it's like we don't see it go from point A to point B. It's there and it's gone. Where did it go? Well, I think the the bottom line is that it can be studied without you necessarily adapting or locking on to one of those possibilities. We just don't know yet. Um, A a final question. The UAP task force, we learned about it uh, last year. It's it's going to be working on this report to submit to Congress supposedly by June. As you and I have had discussions uh, in the recent past, there are some reasons to temper our expectations about this report that would describe for Congress and the public the big picture of what the Pentagon knows about UFOs. Uh, are you optimistic? Uh, are you pessimistic? And, and do you have uh, hopes that maybe with the Space Force, Space Command coming to Huntsville, that maybe there could be room for a, a program, the pet task force or some version of it, within Space Command that would be in your backyard? Well, you're absolutely right that we are like working toward the idea that maybe space can command or something. That, and so is, by the way, I just want to point out that, that Chris Mellon and Lou are doing the same kind of thing. They're looking for that 2.0 version of this whole thing. And, and Lou and them are looking towards getting something that's, you know, the, the, the Pentagon task force is a temporary kind of structure. It, right now it has no funding. Okay. And, and then you've had this change in the political structure where you don't have the guy who put it in the bill, Marco Rubio, as the lead for that Senate Intelligence Committee anymore. You have Mark Warner, who was that. Well, what do we know about Mark Warner? And will he carry that on? Will he make any record and suggest that we do something? The bottom line is that there are there's evidence that's been passed to senators and congressional leaders that clearly shows in classified settings that shows objects that are irrefutable. They're not blurry. They're very distinct. And they are very clearly not ours. And doing maneuvers that you can't do. Much better than these little clips that we've had on the FLIR, the gimbal, and the go fast. Okay, so bottom line, they've seen the evidence and they know that this is something seriously that they gotta they have to deal with. And so Lou and them are trying to be able to get the continuing thing and getting it established that there's a regular program that's going to come into to be that's going to actually work on this, even after the task force thing does its report. And that's what we're hoping for. We're looking for a final, you know, a continuing study that is that has got funding, that's got a program manager, it's got the whole nine yards that's going to be looking at this. And so I'm optimistic about that. I'm a little bit more to the pessimistic about the, the, the Senate Intelligence Task Force because think about it. They're supposed to be getting in 180 days all the sightings from what, 18 different agencies? Yeah. I mean, can, you know as well as I do. I'm telling you that it took us two years to study one case. How do you expect in 180 days that you're going to have this great understanding of all this phenomena that's going on around the country? and have that produced in a report. You know where I'm coming from. Rich Hoffman, thanks very much for your time. I encourage people to go to SCU's website. You have this incredible material, uh, meticulously researched, the Aguadilla case, the Stephenville uh, episode, uh, the Tic Tac Nimitz, and a lot more. And um, we'll have you back on soon. I'm looking forward to it, George. And thanks for all you do, by the way. Thanks a lot. Bye. 